Yeah, I'm going to talk about some of the um, uh, pages from the book. Um, I'll, I'll choose. Some. Last night I did it in Edinburgh. I hadn't talked about it before, and by the time the time was up, I had only got to 1980, so I'm going to skip around quite a lot and just talk about some of the ideas. The, the, the idea of doing this book um, was to try and find, I'm, I'm always, I mean, the book form to me is really important because it's, um, it's something that's available to people, you know, for 10 quid or this one's 20 quid, which is not cheap, but that's the way it goes. But um, it's something that makes the work available. And that's, uh, to me, what the, one of the core things about making political work or um, that it gets it's shown in galleries, and, um, but it's also shown outside galleries, in the street or in books or in posters, that it gets through to a general audience. And it's a, a sort of question that comes up a lot now, because there is a lot of political work being made now, which is, which is fantastic. And a lot of younger artists, are, because of the situation in the world and the state of emergency we're living in, and uh, especially climate catastrophe, um, there's a lot of young people who want to make work. Also, their actual situation as students now, the, the economic uh, austerity is in their faces. It's part of... Um, I mean, I'm, you know, I'm saying this. There's probably quite a lot of you here are students who may be experiencing it. So, um, because it's affecting people's lives uh, actually individually, it means that they want to make work about, about it through their own experience. So there's a lot of political work being done. And um, hopefully it's encouraged by like, art colleges and places. Sometimes it isn't because there is this strange idea, which is very English, and I don't, I don't think of it as so, so... I think it's more English than Scottish, because I think Scotland is much more open to political writing and political art. Um, I mean, that's something one could debate, but I always feel that. And from showing quite a lot in, in uh, Glasgow and Edinburgh over the years, I felt that... I know when we did the show at, um, at street level, it was almost like people... F I got the feeling that people felt supported by seeing work that was against um, the invasion of Iraq. You know, it felt like... To, to see what they were thinking, what they were feeling, but to see it on the wall in, in, a, in a form of art was actually supportive, which I, th you know, which I thought was great. But um, um, so I think the, the sort of the issues around making political work are, are, are really vital now, and 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 all the sort of subtlety that's sometimes encouraged in like art colleges. If, if a student does something very clear, they said, oh, you've got to make it subtle, or you've got to... Art, as if art is sort of layered and subtle, you know, it's not something you add into the cake mix at the end. Um, so hopefully that will change and there, there will be more direct work that will appeal to a general public, because if we're going to make changes in the world, then the art has to get out to the general public, not just to the art people. Um, anyway, so uh, I decided to do a, a book that, that looked at... Because I've been going on for 50 years now making political work, since uh, 1969. So I was asked to do a book, and I didn't want it to be like an art book. I wanted it to be more... Uh, to have a sort of factual edge. Um, facts are obviously totally contested things now. Well, what is a fact? You know, we're, we're run by, you know, like with Johnson and Trump, we've got two people that, where the word fact is, is out the window. I mean, their, 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 their lies are total, um, you know, every day, every hour. So I, I wanted to make something that was factual. So what I've done is take 50 events from 1969 to, to 2019, and then each one starts with a little factual section, and, um, and then it goes into how I made it. That, this is the beginning, which shows the highly digital tools that I use. Um, 
and uh, I sometimes do exhibitions now where I show vitrines with all the, all the little bits of stuff because people, especially young people, are quite intrigued, but you know, when they, they just have a laptop, I still have quite a lot of this sort of thing um, hanging out. Um, so it, it starts off um, with Vietnam, and there's a quote which you won't be able to read. There's two quotes, but the second one by Angela Davis, I think it's great, it just says, walls, walls turn sideways are bridges. Very simple, but like the essence of what montage is about. Um, and it starts off with an image of um, uh, Henry Kissinger, who is the Secretary of State. Um, and then I talk about the bombing of uh, Vietnam and Cambodia and, um, and then have the image. And, and also what I've done here is, is show where the work was reproduced or was commissioned by and also show the roughs. Because I think the important thing with work like this is to think of it as a process of making. It's not like just the finished result. It's a process. And it, in the process, in, in the, uh, one of the roughs, I used magnifying glasses over Kissinger's face um, and put sort of uh, some of the horrors going on in Vietnam inside the magnifying glass. And then in the end, I ended up doing that in a much simpler way in his glasses. And this is what I call, in montage terms, is, a, is, a, is a, fr a given frame. It's a frame that exists. You then plonk something in. And through adding two things together in that way, you create another meaning. And the meaning is, hopefully, rips apart the smooth surface of the image and tells you something of the, what I would call the truth of what's, what they're actually about. And it goes right back to... Um, I don't know if some of you know Rod Rodchenko, who did a portrait of the poet Ozzy Brick. Yeah, someone there knows. Um, and he used uh, glasses. And of course, there's a great series of montages by Martha Rossler, some of you might know, about Vietnam, where she showed a sort of good housekeeping American family in their kitchens with the front image. And then in the window of the kitchen, she'd show outside what, what was going on in Vietnam. Um, the sort of horrors that were going on there out, outside the window, you know. So again, it's like a given frame that she then filled with something else. So, um, and this one's got, you can see it's got the American, the B-52 bomber is double exposed on his forehead. Um, and then, and then I'll just look at this as an early one. This, this was a, uh, an image. So it's a lot of these, I show the source of the image as well, which is, um, so this was a, one of the students who was killed. Four students were shot dead in Kent State University in 1970 in America, in Ohio. Who were they were demonstrating against the Vietnam War. And they were, it was a peaceful demonstration, but the National Guardsmen shot them and four of them died. And that, is one, that was an image that appeared on the TV, black and white TV at the time. So I turned it into this poster. Um, which was printed in what's called dye line, which is a red, water-based red um, ink, and in in and then posted it up with with I was a student at the Slade at the time, and I posted it up with other students as a sort of um, solidarity with the American students, and we posted it up in London. It was quite a big poster, and when it rained, it bled because it's water-based, so it, and in the end, it went blank. So that was the first time I took the work out of the studio into the street. And, and I was studying at Slade at the time, and uh, the w my work was highly unappreciated by the uh, staff at the Slade. And I had my degree show hidden away just next to the gent's bog um, in the basement of the Slade. And at, the, at that time, most people at the Slade were, were either doing uh, Coldstream-type measured nudes, you know, like the, that sort of thing. Or they were doing colour field painting, sort of post Frank Stella. But doing political art was seen as being completely out of it, you know. It, 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 it's a very English thing that um, direct politics, they say that's propaganda. And um, it's a class thing as well, you know. Most of the uh, art history comes from a very... Um, middle class, upper middle class, public school background, 
and and it, there is a political um, uh, sort of argument going on. Um, and I, I was making these works at this time, and and they're very. Um, I wanted to do like a sort of uh, Rorschach type test, so they had a lot of a lot of um, blots and um, very high contrast, and I wanted people to um, get into trying to work out what the images were about. Um, and the images had, like, these are National Guardsmen in America. That was a civil rights demo. That was Vietnam. I, I, I did all these things together on uh, take, getting images and putting them onto 5-4 neg and then printing them and then making these big paintings. Um, and that's them in a gallery at, um, at the Imperial War Museum. So you can see they're quite big. I mean, it's probably a bit difficult to see, but um, and they in fact bought them a couple of years ago. They got the National Art Fund to buy ten of them. So it was like that was my sucks to you to the Slade. You know, forty-five years later, um, <laughs> I know it's childish, isn't it? But I mean, it was that feeling. <laughs> uh, and they've all got this this very broken imagery. They've got at the time we had computer punch cards. Um, and so I used them as stencils and put all these images uh, together into this sort of chaos. And then um, uh, uh, afterwards, after I left Slade, I wanted to make the work more direct because I wanted to get it into newspapers. And um, it, that's the other sort of work. I mean, I find it interesting visually, but it, it needs a gallery. A gallery is are one of the only spaces where people are going to spend time looking at things. When, when stuff's in newspaper or on the street, um, if it's coming from a sort of protest, it's, it's, usually very, it's usually small because one hasn't got money to print, you know, to do things on hoardings. Um, and so you've got, to do, you've, got to, you've got to do something that's going to get through to people very quickly. So I started using a much more, I suppose, in a sense, it's a traditional you know, technique that maybe came from more from Hartfield, where you you just have two things and you you smash them together. And this was one about Bloody Sunday, um, where um, you know the people were killed, and, and uh, um, they've only re only in the last year they now well this year they're going to charge one soldier for it. Soldier Z, I think it's called, isn't it? As a sort of yeah, well, we won't go into that. But that's, um, and then, uh, then I go into Chile, where I did a lot of work about Chile, because um, it seemed really important that um, uh, you know you had a, a, a democratically elected um, socialist uh, government run by Salvador Allende, and there was this enormous campaign um, from the, um, the, ch the Chilean middle class and the CIA. I mean, the CIA was totally behind the destruction of Allende. And, and as we know, um, there, was a, there was a military coup and Pinochet took over. And, um, and it was the most horrific bloodbath. Um, and at the time, some of the people got out who'd been tortured, and I taught some of them. They came to North, North London Poly. And the stories were just unmentionable about what happened. But I, I, I got pictures of some of the people that were disappeared. You know, the, what, the, what the junta did, they came and grabbed people at four in the morning from their beds and they were never seen again. They, were, they disappeared. And Amnesty had photos, so I did this picture of a soldier painting them out. And then I gave the image back to Amnesty and they made a poster that they could sell. You know, they put words on it. And that's one of the... another thing of doing this sort of work is actually um, supporting different groups by giving them material to sell. Obviously, they're all charities. They all need to, to be sponsored. And, um, and obviously, a lot of these events, people don't know about them. And like Chile is a really important thing, you know, because it, 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 it showed what can happen if you get a socialist um, government, you know, the, the pressures on them to which is what's happened in Venezuela, you know. Yeah, yeah, so it's the, it's, it's the lessons. So hopefully that it will be 
you know, if young people still read books, but I think they do some of them, you know. Um, that was the idea of doing it like this. But um, on, on, on that one, that, that was just showing it as a sort of charnel house. And then, and, that, and, and that's why one of the things you're saying, that's why I go into how the work was received as well. So they realise that there is, because I, I did a show at the Barbican Centre in London, and um, one of the images is of a, a soldier with a tor tortured head, big, a big work on canvas. And another one was the one before the charnel house. And just on the evening it was going to open, the director of the, not of the art gallery bit, but of the uh, Barbican came down. His name was Henry Rong, which I think is a really great name. Um, and he said, oh, you can't show these. We've got a Chilean defence minister, um, no, the Chilean finance minister coming to talk to Midland bankers here tomorrow, and he might be offended. Um, and this was during Pinochet's realm. This was 10 years after Pinochet had had taken over and the fascists had taken over. Um, and so he asked us to take the work down. The people that put the work up refused to take, this was hanging from the scene, refused to take it. And, and they refused to take the small one. So when we came back in the morning, the big one was covered with a felt blanket and the smaller one had been unscrewed from the wall and taken down. And, uh, and it's an example of uh, sort of political censorship, um, which you don't really hear about very often in this country. Obviously, uh, you hear about it in other countries, and writers and artists in many countries in the world are locked up and killed now, you know, for, for what they do. Whereas here, people think, well, you can do anything. But what happens now is something like that w would not probably slip, slip into the Barbican if it's too specific. Um, it, it, it's, it's censorship by omission, really. Um, and companies sponsor things. Sponsorship has a big effect now on what we see. You know, and sponsors love a general existential sort of birth copulation and death type art, like you know, Damien Hirst type thing. That's great. That's always sponsored. But anything that's specifically targeted or has a logo on it from an oil company or whatever like that that you're critiquing, um, you're not going to get through. So. And that's a big issue, especially, especially a big issue for young, young artists because most of the places are sponsored now. Now public money has been sucked away from so many institutions. Um, um, private money and, and uh, private sponsorship is a big part of the landscape. Anyway, that, so there was that. And then that's um, when the, the work was used um, when Pinochet was arrested when he came to Britain ten years later by um, uh, there was a great Spanish judge who'd, who, who, who was trying to arrest uh, warmongers when they came out of their country. And he did arrest Pinochet. And um, uh, this is outside the court where Pinochet was coming to. And a lot of these protesters were Chileans who'd lost family and, and friends to Pinochet. And then this car came along with his blacked out windows and he was in there. And, and and he, he went to the hearing of the trial, and then Jack Straw um, said he should go back, he should be allowed to go back to Chile because he was so ill. You know, Pinochet arrived in a wheelchair. And um, so he sent him back, that's the, the Labour Home Secretary, or the new Labour Home Secretary, I think we should call him, shouldn't we? Horrendous. And then when Pinochet got back to Chile, he got out of the wheelchair and walked across the tarmac. He was fine, you know. I mean, it was. It was disgusting. Um, and, and, and of course, he used to come over here a lot because he used to have, have tea with Margaret Thatcher. She loved him. Um, they used to have tea together quite regularly. So uh, she got very upset when she thought he was going to go to prison. That's, um, that's about arms conversion. So this is about um, Lucas Aerospace, who is a, which was an amazing group of workers who were working at Lucas Aerospace, which was a weapons factory, and it was going to be shut down, and they were going to be made redundant. And they came up with a whole plan of using existing plant to make socially useful um, uh, object, objects and inventions. 
and they, they worked with academics, other unionists, and uh, um, designers, and they actually made prototypes of things like um, uh, there was a road rail bus that was ecologically very um, uh, very good, didn't use a lot of CO2. Uh, there was a, a, a cart for kids with spina bifida. That was, all, this, all these amazing things. And they didn't just sort of write them down. They actually made the prototypes. Um, and it's still... And the, the, the Lucas Plan, as it's called, is still being referred to today uh, you know, as, as what is possible. There's a, you know, when they talk about if we shut weapons factories, there'll be all this unemployment. You know, in fact, that you could employ much more people making socially useful products than you can making bombs. Um, so I did some sort of symbolic... That's Trident, which lives up the road, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah which um, is being reconditioned now. Estimated cost maybe 210 billion over the next 20 years, something like that. The less said about the better. So I just did this, turning it into corn. Um, I got someone to... I, I don't often uh, um, emerge from Hackney in middle London, you know, so I didn't... I got someone to get me some corn from the countryside. And then I did a talk, and this young kid said, well, why have you put it upside down? And I hadn't actually realised that corn didn't grow that way up. But <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so um, yeah. But... Um, and we did a, I did a book about um, the uh, alternative plan of the Lucas workers, and that bombs into um, food uh, sacks and t tanks into tractors. Very simple sort of ideas, and um, you know, which you can do now with a morphing tool on a on, on Photoshop, I think. But um, but it's one of the things about uh, montage that you. Photo, I mean, what I call photomontage is something when you, when you have an image, you look for visual similarity and you try and join it together and create something that has a sort of reality to it. Um, so it's very different from Dadaist collage. Um, I mean, if you go to the collage, so you, they've got some great, like Hannah Hawks and things. Um, her work's fantastic. But it's mainly very explosive and very fragmentary. And it's like She's sort of mirroring a sort of shattered society through a uh, sort of shattered mirror, that sort of idea. Whereas with, with mo montage, I mean, there's always dispute between m montage and collage. With montage, you're actually tr creating a, a sort of realism of the object, um, which uh, um, relates much more to surrealism than Dada, I think. You know, there is a sort of relationship to surrealism. Uh, and the great theorist of montage, Walt Benjamin, was very much discussing surrealism in terms of montage. Um, um, in fact, you know, some of his essays are on uh, photography and montage are still very much worth reading. They're amazing. Um, so that's about the Guildford Four. I'll just have to go through some of these. Uh, and I, I, as I say, I put the roughs in so you can see how scrabbly they are. And I never used to show the originals because I thought of them as something to reproduce, but um, especially young people love to see all this muck and bits of sellotape and bits of carpet stuck on because it was down on the floor and all that. Um, and, and I've found that with students now, they're much more concerned, more and more with the materiality of, uh, of, of working. I mean, like here, there's a dark room that very used, isn't it? You know, people actually want to make things um, non-digitally. And, and Photoshop has become one tool amongst many to a lot of students, which is great. And, um, and the art schools, a lot of them are trying to buy back all the stuff they gave away, all the enlargers and amazing printing presses, because they thought, wow, we can have big, clean rooms with silent students in front of computers and there'll be no mess, and it'll be, you can fill it up with students. But the students have actually demanded that there should be, you know, actual tangibility of actual materials like that. 
So, so when I show them, I show them as very rough bits of cardboard with the images stuck on. Um, that's about apartheid, and that one is as well. Um, and that's just joining two images together. Um, and that's by, uh, it's a great photographer, South African photographer, I've forgotten his name. Uh, House of Bondage. Is anyone there? You know, yeah. It's amazing. Anyway, he, he did the photograph of the woman on the whites only bench. And th you know, that was actually written on the street furniture. And then I added this image, which is very broken and, and scratched. And, and it's another thing that I'm trying to do with some of them is, is you know, is have this, these distancing devices, which relate to, um, you know, what Benjamin and Brecht was talking about, Brecht with his epic theatre, where he didn't want people to get sucked into a, a realism. He wanted people to be thinking when they looked, to actually position themselves in relation to what was being shown. And he actually said, you know, he'd be very happy if at the end of a play uh, the audience went out of two doors, you know, one who thought one thing and one the other. He didn't, it wasn't this idea of just unifying everyone. And the idea of this is to keep this idea that it's obviously constructed and there's a sort of distancing in there. And it's true of a lot of this work that it's quite roughly made. Um, so you can see the edges, and, and that is, I don't mind about that. That roughness, I think, is, is um, important. Wait a minute, I'll, I'll, I'll go through some of that. That was, do people remember Blair Peach, who was killed? Yeah, he was an anti-fascist campaigner. Uh, amazing guy in his 30s, teacher. And he was killed by the special patrol group, uh, which was the English sort of, police, uh, a group within the police, and it was the same year that the, the uh, Metropolitan Police issued these stamps, which was because it was 150 years of the Metropolitan Police, so they issued these celebratory stamps. So I had the stamp and then the uh, magnifying glasses again with Blair Peach and the copper. And that was done as a postcard for the family of Blair Peach to raise awareness. Um, and that one is the Hay Wayne one, uh, which when, when I first did it, I, I took it into um, uh, the National Gallery and mixed it up with their cards. We did postcards of it so that people got it. And you, so you did get tourists buying it thinking, you know, we'll send it back to Texas and they didn't actually see the missiles on it. <laughs> so it was like, yeah. Yeah. Have they got a print of it? Yeah, oh, that's right, I have. Goma, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and, and underneath, it's a bit difficult to see, but it's me standing in front of, with a reproduction of this version in front of the Hay Wayne because we um, campaigned against the arms trade a few years ago, campaigned against them being, um, they were entertaining a, a a group called Finn Mechanica, which is the eighth biggest um, arms manufacturers in the world, um, in the National Gallery. And they were taking money from them and having them there. So there was a big demonstration, and I stood in front of it with that and got, got moved out of the way. But uh, in the end, they, the National Gallery pulled, um, pulled out of that sponsorship, pulled out of that... Um, in the same way that the Tate, in the end, pulled out a BP sponsorship. And I read today the Royal Shakespeare Company has pulled out of BP sponsorship as well, which is fantastic. And that's, that was to do with a, a group of very young people who'd written to the RSC a couple of weeks ago. School kids, I think. Um, so th th these sort of things, uh, uh, people, especially young people, are becoming very conscious now of things like sponsorship. And it's... All over the world it's happening, there's been big things happening at the Whitney Museum in the States. And, um, it, it's that artists are, n are not just signing petitions, but they're actually putting their work, taking their work in and out and, and actually doing something about it. Um, uh, so, which is, I think, a very positive thing. And of course you've got Nan Goldin who's um, campaigning against opioids and 
she got the um, uh, National Portrait Gallery to, not to take a million quid, I think it was, for, um, from the Sackler family um, because they were the people that produced opioids. So all those things are, are very much happening now. And, and this, what I've done here is, is show some of the things that inspired the work. This was a, on the edge is a, is a watercolour. It says cruise missiles, the important questions. Um, and what they've done is they, they've got a watercolour of cruise missiles. Uh, beautiful. This is from the Ministry of Defence. So there is a watercolour artist there um, producing. I uh, hope it's not one of my ex-students. Uh, <laughs> And, um, and they said, cruise missiles will melt into the countryside. Don't worry about them. It sounds a bit dodgy to me. I mean, that's what inspired me to make the Haywain one. And uh, obviously, some of you remember, remember Protect and Survive, which is a government leaflet, which said things like, um, if you've got a fire extinguisher, keep it handy. You know, this is in terms of a nuclear war being declared and remove lace curtains in case they set on fire and things like that. Um, and, and that, that um, was sent out, it was meant to be sent out to all the homes, everybody in the country, but they didn't send it because it got such ridicule that they stopped. And, um, and I did a version of a skeleton reading, Protect and Survive. Um, and at the top it says, have you ever wished you better informed? And I got that from a Times advert at the time, which says, have you ever wished you were better informed? So with montage, you can use the, take some of the language that's around as well as the um, imagery. And, and uh, this one was a thing called Athena, who used to have poster shops all over the place. And they would got a catalog, and it had um, American pickup, it's called the 20th century, power and energy. American pickup trucks, very nice ones. And then an enormous, great, fucking, fucking great nuclear cloud, all airbrushed to look nice, you know. So, uh, what was happening was it, it had become normalised. The nuclear, you know, the, nu the horrors of nuclear imagery had become normalised, which is why I wanted to, to, to break that through images, and that, and that's showing it, uh, the CND symbol, um, and a rough that I did. Um, which didn't work. It looks a bit like British Rail or something. Um, but uh, that was just done very crudely again. Um, and that was it when it was used. Um, and I think there was... Uh, uh, maybe not. Uh, but that, but that, that, that was just... Made, you can see it's on an old bit of cardboard. And... Um, it was just a, a cardboard CND symbol which was photographed on 35 mil and then blown up. And then it, it was a, I had pictures of missiles that the Ministry of Defence had given me very kindly, but, but they stopped giving them for some reason. <laughs> but, so for that one, I, I bought a toy missile from uh, a Hamlet's big toy shop. They had a missile department at that time for <laughs> four year olds, you know. And I bought, the, I bought a plastic missile and smashed it out with a hammer and then photographed it and stuck this bit on the end. So it's very much a constructed image. Um, but it was, to, it, was to, it was to activate the peace symbol, because it had become connected to an earlier version of CND than I um, was working with. And um, at the same time, solidarity was under th threat in Poland. Um, and I don't know if, I mean, I won't go into the, all the politics, but some of you might remember solidarity. Um, and they had this amazing logo, which um, uh, looked like, which was done by a young designer um, whose name I get there. I haven't got my glasses on, so I'll, but uh, it looks like all the all the words. Uh, he said he wanted it to look like people sort of jo jostling each other along, pushing each other forward. So he put all these letters, push forward, and it, it, it was under threat from the uh, Polish communist government. So I did these things for, for Polish solidarity. They asked for some posters. And, and that one I had to do very quick. And, and at that time, of course, there was no Google images. So I had to do, get a picture of a bayonet. 
So what I did, I, I rushed down to Buckingham Palace and photographed one of those characters walking up and down in front of the, the palace and, and photographed their bayonet and uh, used that. So there's usually a way of, in some ways it was easier because there were less images around and uh, you know, it's a whole debate about that. And that was actually done for the Labour Party who at the time were unilateral um, uh, and hopefully will be again in a couple of years, you know, giving up the bomb before, anyone, before everyone else does. And that, that um, was what I was talking about, that if you show this nuclear cloud, you've got to show very directly what it's, what it's about, you know. Um, and for that one, I did, I did a lot of roughs. And um, as I was doing it, I suddenly saw that the plume of the nuclear explosion fitted, it fitted exactly into the, uh, um, the neck of the skeleton. So it's, that's what I'm talking about, about trying to make a new reality of an image. You know, it's looking for those connections um, with that one. Uh, and that's just different stuff. That, that was a minor strike. Um, and sometimes with this things I'm using, I use dust and various bits of grit and stuff on, on the image and re-photograph it. And that one's um, about Chernobyl. And that, that image of the Earth, um, which, you know, is probably the most, maybe the most important photo ever taken, one could say, you know, from the, by the, by the uh, Apollo um, astronauts. And when I first wanted to use it, I went to picture agencies. I mean, I haven't gone into all the copyright things now, but at that time I went into the picture. And it was quite weird because usually a picture agency, one agency has a picture. But this one, I kept going to different ones, and they all seemed to have this picture of the Earth. And I thought, that's a bit suspicious. So I rang, I rang up NASA, the space, you know, the... Um, uh, the, the organization that actually gets the spaceman up in the sky. And um, they said, oh, there's no copyright on that image. Um, anyone can use it. So it's quite interesting that the, uh, the picture agencies had all decided, well, because it's free, we'll then say we own it and charge for it. I thought that was a nice sort of, well, I don't blame them. They, they, were looking, you know, they weren't that well off a lot of them. But, um, and, and, um, and then in 87, Thatcher came in, and I did a picture of her as Queen Victoria, because she said we must return to Victorian values. Um, and unfortunately, I did hear from a high up Tory official that, um, that she liked it. <laughs> and she had it up in the, she had it, he said he, she had it up in the bog at number 10. I mean, I don't know if it's true. But that, so that I put up in the thing, I said, a failed montage, you know. I mean, that is total failure. Um, and then at the bottom, there's a, there's a picture from The Economist of the, um, the Earth one with the missiles coming down. And it's a group have made a papier-mâché sculpture, which is great, of it for a march. But then The Economist got a photographer to photograph it and then do a very anti-CND, you know, they were very pro-nuclear. So, the, obviously, I have no control over something like that if the photographer has decided to photograph it. Um, and uh, um, the economists can do what they want with it. So, it's, it's always interesting when things go out in the world in a different way. I mean, I have seen on picture agencies that a lot of, some of my stuff has been photographed without the frame or the edge. So it looks like the it looks like a, a, a photographic it looks like an image, and they're selling that through the agencies. So it's, you know, it's dodgy things can happen, obviously. Um, and then there's a whole load of Thatcher. There's one I did of her with a gas mask that came quite. A lot of street artists got into um, putting gas masks on people, and um, I have had emails people saying, uh, young people saying, uh, I quite like what you're doing, Pete, but. I think you're, you're ripping off Banksy. And I have to say, right back and say, well, he wasn't actually even alive when that was done. So <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's interesting the way history gets elided. Um, and that was the uh, Berlin Wall 
coming down. Um, again, that, that had to be done very quickly. So at that time, there wasn't any, you know, now if a Berlin Wall came down, you'd have about 5,000 pictures on Google Images straight away. At that time, I couldn't find any of the actual wall being broken um, or uh, a section of it. So I went around Hackney and photographed a bit of wall and then stuck it on the end. So, you know, it was actually a composite image because it went into the, the, the next day's, the Monday's uh, newspaper. Um, so it had to be done very fast. And, um, and that's a picture of the actual, the wall bit, and then I broke it out. So I've tried to show, the, as I say, the process. Um, and that's when Mandela got released. And uh, the image in the middle is him. It's the last photo taken of him before he was sent to prison. He went to prison for 27 years, most of it in Robin Island. Um, so that, that, when he was released, that was the last picture that had been shown of him. Um, 27 years before. So I got one of those obscene signs they had in South Africa and then just smashed it up and broke it up and photographed it uh, with that one. And there's a bit about Maastricht there, which is bit very relevant to Brexit. I won't go into now. But, uh, and John Major is the Mona Lisa. He, he, look, he looks remarkably like the Mona Lisa. It's quite extraordinary. <laughs> and, and I started getting into more three-dimensional, more physical uh, things. So I did things with newspapers um, and with drawn images uh, and photocopied images so that the materiality of the photocopy was merged with charcoal. Uh, and, and, and all these were shown on um, stands um, in, in a room just lit, lit from above, like that. And they were actually shown at the art school in Edinburgh about 15 years ago, I think, maybe more. Um, and the idea is that these people are looking back. Uh, we're looking at them, they're looking back at us, and the share prices are all behind them. They're all on the world papers with the share. So you get these serried ranks of these numbers, and then you get the humanity that's being affected by underneath. And that was uh, the separation wall, or apartheid wall, if you want to call it, in Palestine. And I, I actually went to Bethlehem and with a few artists, and it was organized by Banksy, in fact, again, uh, to, met, to, to do a show there. And um, Banksy made a new print and when he makes new new print, everyone goes ballistic, you know, all these collectors. But he made it so that they had to come over to Bethlehem, which is in Palestine, to, to, to buy it. They couldn't buy it online. So you got some quite traumatized um, collectors arriving uh, who'd learned a lot. You know, they've been, some of them have been stuck in Tel Aviv airport for five hours or whatever, you know, which can happen over there. Um, and, uh, and then they bought it, and, and it, it made a million pounds over there, and all that money stayed in Palestine for education projects and arts projects with young people. So, you know, he, he does, does do good stuff with his money. So there's another one on Palestine. Um, and some of the work, as I say, I use this idea of charcoal and photography merged together uh, to create a sort of... Um, Quite a sort of broken down uh, Im images, um, and that was Kyoto Pro Protocol, which was the um, uh, in in '97, which was you know the first one of the first big ecological conferences um, to bring down greenhouse gases, but, uh, and that's, um, how long ago is that? That's uh, 20, 22 years. So they're pretty slow off the mark, the governments. And that was down Seattle, which was the same sort of thing. And in 2000, I did a, sh a, a show with, uh, the Millennium Dome was built by the Labour, New Labour, 
and it was this uh, costing a fortune, and it was like real new labor type idea. You know, it was um, uh, you, you went in, and the first thing you saw was a McDonald's, from what I can remember, and it, and it was really talking down to people, and um, it was very it was very unpopular, and they lost millions over it. But I made my own version of it with a sort of torn umbrella and a uh, lot of broken down pallets. And then I wrote this sort of poem about it, which is on that page. Um, about It's a sort of the follies of new labor, really. That's the, uh, the terrorist attacks on New York in America. That, that opened up the war on, you know, the war on terror, which is what these and these these were experimenting with different materials. They're quite big things, and they were taking this idea of the smart bomb, which um, and drone warfare. You know, they say it's smart that it only hits um, the person they're going for, which is a complete lie. It, you know, people, a lot of people were dying, and and um, in Afghanistan, um, uh, there was a, a, a wedding guest, and 30, there was a wedding, and 30 people were killed with this so called smart bomb. So I did a whole lot of images using the crosshairs idea. And, uh, and they're very broken down, they're quite big things. They're very broken down, and uh, again, trying to experiment with the materiality of the thing, with the, the um, quality. And, and um, this was a time of Iraq, and um, th that was an image I'd originally done about the Cold War with a hammer and sickle in one eye, but I just changed it to the Union Jack. And, uh, and again, it's this thing that we're, we're talking about where I looked at the, at, at the Earth and, you know, and then stuck the gas mask on the globe and photographed it and then stuck it on the Earth. So again, it's that thing of looking to see what fits. These were the ones that uh, Malcolm was talking about that were shown in street level. Um, the, all these things based on medals. And, and on the medal is, is destruction at the end or the victim. It's something you never see is the, the smoothness of the medal and the victim in the same image. It's, it's something that's completely separate in our culture. So I put them together. Um, and, and they're not against um, the bravery of soldiers that get medals. I mean, when I showed them at the Imperial War Museum, I thought I might get quite um, attacked for, you know, the look. but in fact, a lot of ex-service um, guys talked to me and they actually said, you know, they actually responded positively to, to that sort of idea. Because, um, you see these generals who are dripping with medals, and they're not the ones that fought anyway. You know, they're the ones that sat sat at home giving the orders. Um, so that's the UN. That's another climate. So all the way through here, um, the the climate comes through, and that's the Stern report, which was 2006, which again we talked about two percent rise. Um, uh, in, in CO2 as being dangerous. So, uh, and that's an oil spill. And that was, that was used last year, the year before, for a Cape Tempest, uh, for a poem that she wrote. So that we used that image. Um, and this is, and the other thing that comes through all the time is Trident. That would go on, go on the House of Commons meets, and uh, there's another upgrade for Trident. It sort of goes on, it's like a sort of narrative that goes through it for this um, obscene um, object that uh, is, is unusable. Um, and that was a sort of performative thing I did in, about the economic crash taking this sort of cart out in front of the stock exchange. But, uh, and then I did do some images of like hands on stock market pages, just pulling at them. And when these are shown, 
you do get the actual newspaper with the tears and then you get the image of the hands which are done in photocopy and charcoal to, to again try and get a sort of visceral physicality to things and this was a, a recent thing where I've done a, one of the things about drones is um, they turn the noise up on them to frighten people and also people talked about the shadow of the drones coming over their villages you know it's this horrific shadow so I did a, a series of work that had these faces and there's a, a projection of a, uh, a drone which is, which is put onto glass so it's, there's an image of a, a drone on glass on, with li done with liquid light on the glass and then um, it, it's projected with a light onto the, these faces which haven't got mouths so that it becomes like a sort of crossed out mouth and, and that's a sort of installation um, and that's oil, deep water horizon uh, that's an actual photograph um, of, of, well, it's not someone, it's me, in fact, with all this uh, molasses all over me. Try and get a sort of visceral image. And that was for the G8 making a poster. I mean, one of the great things about the internet, we did these posters and then put them onto, I think, I think, called, I think it was at the time it was Tumblr, and you could put high res ones on and people could print their own prints out and then use them, which people did. And that's austerity. Again, that's using like photography and dust. Um, and that's photography and palettes. And then that started off as a commission of doing something about poverty, and then it ended up like actually instead of making photos, I, I smashed up palettes and put very thin photographic paper onto the top, and then poured dust on top of that, so that they become like emanations, like uh, um, like a sort of, like someone's laying on the pallet and it's left a sort of imprint. Um, and there's a whole series, a whole series of them. And that's you using that image, you know, it's depressing in a sense. It's horrible that 35 years later, it's still relevant. And th this was another upgrade of um, renewing Trident. This was in 2016. And CND managed to get uh, um, all these poster sites on the underground. So that those all different undergrounds in London for the demonstration. But it, but it, you know, it, it went through Parliament. And uh, um, this last one, they reckon, CND reckons it will cost 205 billion pounds for this thing. And that was a demonstration at the time. There's Nicholas Sturgeon there. And these are these, so th these are like photo paintings. They're sensitized canvas with uh, paint on top, oil paint. And oil paint merges in with the photographic. And they're all faces that it's like a, it's an exhibition and you see a whole wall, it looks like black squares, a bit like, um, you know, you think it's sort of Malevich or something. And then you look closely and there are these faces coming through without mouths. There's a whole series of them. And that, um, they were used uh, different times. That was about Syria. And then it goes up to 2018, and that was when uh, Oxfam reported that uh, the 26 richest people own the same amount of wealth as the poorest half of humanity, which is 3.8 billion people, which is quite a stack. It's, in, it's impossible to comprehend, but that's... Uh, and the number goes down. They reckon it's 19 of the richest people now. Um, and then it ends on Trump and oil and kicking the world to boots and alert um, and destruction. And then that was Extinction Rebellion where we projected some of these images on Marble Arch a few months ago. When was it? April. And then the last image is pulling back 
you know, resistance. So that's the sort of uh, outline of the of the uh, of the book, you know, and and um, hopefully it, it's it's you know it's trying to be a new way to show work in the sense that it is um, uh, ab about the actual events rather than just about the making of it.